2 Kings chapter 6, begin reading with verse 24 and reading through the first eight verses of chapter 7. And it came to pass after this that Behenadad, king of Syria, gathered all his hosts and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it until an ass head was sold for four pieces of silver, and the fourth part of a cab of doves dung for five pieces of silver. And as the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, there cried a woman unto him, saying, Help, my lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord do not help thee, whence shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor, out of the winepress. And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? And she answered, The woman said unto me, Give thy son that we made him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and did eat him. And I said unto her on the next day, Give thy son that we may eat him. And she hath hid her son. Turn with me to the first verse of the seventh chapter. And we read, beginning with verse 1. And Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Then a Lord, on whose hand the king leaned, again answered the man of God, and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not eat thereof. And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate. And they said one to the other, Why sit we here until we die? If we say we'll enter into the city, then the famine is in the city and we'll die there. If we sit here, we die also. Now therefore come, let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. If they kill us, we shall but die. And they rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one of another, Lo, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites, the kings of the Egyptians, to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight, left their tents, their horses, their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink, and carried thence silver, gold, raiment, and went and hid it, and came and entered into another tent, and carried it thence also, and went and hid it. Then they said one to another, We do not well. This is a day of good tidings. We hold our peace. If we tear till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now for come that we may go and tell the king's household. I just give this a title that the lame take the prey. The lame take the prey. We have here a picture of those who've broken away. I think of the dead religious systems. The Bible talks about what they broke out of. It was a place of famine. You have to know there was a real famine there, but when you boil it down to the spiritual, it talks about uh, uh, just a small amount of dove's dung selling for an enormous price. Now, dove's dung here, you know what that's talking about. That's all that's left after the dove is gone. The Holy Spirit's left and you just have the refuse of religion. That's all that's there. And they're outside of that now. And we're here are four leprous men outside of a system that had nothing to offer but death, but they didn't know it. There was this system of religion of course, in that day it is very real, but we have and must know that we're dealing with a spiritual situation now. And these men have broken away from this system. 
A leper in those days was an outcast. He had to keep a distance of other people. He knew he needed help. He was well aware that he was a dead man. This leprosy was a disease that was relentless. It worked its way through it all. Now, we have recognized leper in the Bible as being a type sometime of sin. But here with these men, they were outcasts. They had to constantly wonder about saying to all that they met, unclean, unclean, unclean. They were not allowed among the folk uh, in this more sophisticated system. Now, the religious people who imposed this separation on them were worse than they were, but they didn't know it. They were worse than the leper, but they didn't know it. Death was a work in there, but they didn't know they were dead. They were caught up in a system of religion. This man here that testified this morning, no doubt was a Buddhist before Thursday night when he come to know Jesus as having risen from the dead. He was a part of a religious system that offered him nothing, but he did not know it. The religious system in this day of the lepers had imposed upon the man a separation, and yet they that imposed the separation were worse than the leper because he at least knew that he had to have help. Now the devil had taken the entire system captive, locked it into its little church creeds. Death was everywhere. It had no hope, no life. It is just a system that a man become a part of and could practice without changing his life. You can always know systems that have no effect and are not of God. Any religion you can practice without changing your life, without making you a holy person, is a system of death. It only adds to what you already are and makes it more difficult to find your way out of that darkness. That system that locks a man in, that he just practices certain principles, but yet no real change in his life. Now this is a true picture of religion without God. Death is everywhere, and nobody has the answer, and nobody looks for an answer, because nobody really knows they're dead. This is a problem with religion. Once it's lost God, once it begins to propagate itself, it learns how to go through certain rituals of religion, but yet it lacks the power. It's a form without the power to change. And yet it does not recognize that it's dead. Therefore, it seeks no answer. Whatever poses to be the answer becomes a mortal enemy of the system. If you stand up and say that you have an answer, then you become an enemy of that system. Let a man stand up and declare without any reservation that God is the way out and there is an answer and that man is branded a rebel and the religious systems are ready to kill him. Let him just stand up in the midst of this death, all of it. When you have a church, churches full of people whose lives are not changed, the, the alcoholic continues in his alcohol. The drug in his drug, the whoremonger the way he is. Yet he graces a church pew on a Sunday morning. And some folks tell him he's saved. He continues on in his lifestyle. But yet has had Jesus to what he is. And the system tells him that he's all right. But a man stands up and says without fear, there is an answer to this dilemma. There is a power that can change it all. And that man is immediately branded a rebel. These lepers are outside that gate. They may never have been in there, but they're outside. They know more than the people on the inside. It's an amazing thing. You can fool silly, deceive religious people into accepting anything. But a sinner, that's the reason God says that the minister of God must have a good report of them that are without.
He must have a good. They may not believe what we preach. They may think that you're preaching too strict a gospel. But I'll tell you one thing. If what you preach you live, you've got a good report of them. But you preach you don't live. And you'll discover that you can find religious people that can swallow that. They're religiously dead, caught up into a snare. The people in this auditorium, 85% of them, belong to somebody's system before they're ever born again. They were something. They belong to religion. I've had them tell me, the vast majority, they belong to somebody's church, somebody's organization. Then they were born again. A new life came. And they never realized till then that they were dead all the time. But you let a man stand up. Let a man knowing God stand up and say there's an answer to this mess. God has a way out and they brand him as a rebel. Listen, Elijah rose up in the midst of that famine. They're starving. Nobody has anything. There's a woman boiled her boy today to eat him and is expecting to eat the other boys tomorrow and the king is pulling his hair. Nobody has an answer and the man of God rose up and said, I can tell you in 24 hours there'll be a bargain out here to get flour for, for in 24 hours you'll have more to eat and you can handle the price that that mule's head that's selling for $150 will only be fit for the dogs in the street. Tomorrow, man will buy a square meal in the best restaurant for a dollar and a half. Oh, yes, sir, he stood up in the midst of that darkness and said there's an answer hallelujah there's a famine but there's an answer what well, man of God said in 24 hours God will change this scene of death into life with that prophecy the religious head of state rose up and said behold if the Lord could make windows in heaven this might be you know what he was saying he was saying God don't work that way we've got to have trained counselors and strengths to deal with this massive problem there's no 24 hour solution we've got to build hospitals we've got to have some kind of neurological centers and drug abuse centers. I'm not preaching against that. I'm just here to tell you, mister, that it don't take years for you to get free. I'm here to tell you in this television audience that at this altar this morning, you can lay that needle down. You don't ever have to be a homosexual again. You can find an answer to life right here this morning. You can walk out of here a new creature. I am saying to you, it isn't the years of living in a halfway house. It's finding God at that altar. The man of God rose up. He said tomorrow there'll be an answer here. And the religious head rose up. God don't work that way man. It's going to take massive amounts of money. We're going to have to have counselors. It's going to take a while to work this out. That's a death inside that camp. I said that's a death inside that camp. We've come full circle. I said, we've come full circle from that day till now. You are considered demented or worse if you tell the junkie, the homosexual, the hardened criminal, all you need is Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. I'm going to run here this morning. I know it. Oh, hallelujah to God. Yes, sir, you're some kind of a simpleton. There are no simple answers to this problem. This is a third president. I've watched declare war on drugs, and it's a thousand times worse than it is now. Now than it was when the first one did. I, I, I've lived long enough as a boy. I remember prohibition. Then I remember the legalizing. That's going to be the answer. But liquor flows a million times more tonight than it did then. Listen, there is no answer but one. And it's a simple answer. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. I said hallelujah. I said it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Stand up in the midst of it all. Say to that man with a needle hanging in his arm. It don't have to be that way. It was fun when he started to smoke that crack. But it isn't fun anymore. It, it's, it's, a, it's a bondage. It's a jail. I looked at a woman on that 48 hour said she is 35 years old looked like she's a hundred been hooked on crack for several years 
I said, oh, my God, they ought to run that ad. That ought to be how they advertise it. This is what crack can do for you. But I can tell you one thing. It may have been fun the first night, but she is saying to Mr. Rathers, I'd give a thousand worlds to be free. Let me tell you, it's not somewhere yonder. It's right here now that you can walk out. Oh, hallelujah to God. There's an answer to this problem. You let a man begin to say that. And he becomes to the religious trying to short circuit things. Tell the addict that the church is a custodian of redemption. That he can find deliverance at her altar. And a gleam of hope will come in his eye. Amen. You let that man, that woman that knows Christ, look at that man that's bound and fettered in this world of darkness and say to him, our ladies march into that jail. Our men walk in. They look in the eyes of those that are bound with all of this and without hesitation open that Bible and say to those ladies and those men, there's an answer to your problem. You don't have to spend your time in jail. You don't have to get out of here and go to a halfway house. You can find in this jail cell the answer to life you can walk out here not like you came you came in here an addict you came in here lost you can walk out free thank God the new creature in Christ that's what I'm telling you that let the church one more time shout to a world we are the custodian of redemption but when you do you must keep him from the do-it-yourself religious for they will tell you it'll take months to get him out of this and it's a lifetime of struggle that's hell told that lie mister he whom the sun sets free is free indeed thank God when he delivers he delivers that alcohol walks out of that jail he's free he's no longer an alcohol he don't have to go to the meetings and testify I'm an alcoholic and been dry he can say I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus the Lord. If all the church can offer is a $500 a day drug treatment, you ought to close the doors. You hear me? I, I'm glad for anything they can do for them out there. But I'm here to tell you there's a better answer. I said there's a better answer. It isn't $500 a day, it's your life. Put it on that altar. Open that spirit up to God. Let Jesus walk in. There's an answer to everything. I said there's an answer to everything. This is the message of the church. Hallelujah. The outcast become the answer. Oh, thank God. He said he took the foolish to confound the wise. The lame it is that take the prey. The outcast become the answer. It isn't the smart boys of society. He said he takes the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Not many rich men, not many wise men, but he reaches down to people like you and me that run hard nose up against life and are willing to say I don't have an answer I am in trouble somebody has got to help me out of here oh hallelujah to God it never happens until that happens when you come to a place you've reached the end of your row it's over with I can't change this leper spot I can't have the cubic to my statue I'm bound I know I'm bound I want out the outcasts have the answer. It is a lame that take the prey. Oh, yes. I said, it's a lame that take the prey. Four leprous men, listen to it, outside the system, they are not allowed to be a part. I said, they're not allowed to be a part of it. Here they sit, outside of that gate. That's a progressive, a progressive disease. If you've never seen it, it's a horrifying spectacle to see a man. The fingers are all gone. The toes, half the foot is gone. Wherever it's working, it just watch them disappear before your eyes. It's an evil, awful disease. And they're outside the gate, not allowed to be a part of the system. They rejected the doctrine that a better 
better self-image would help their leprosy. Oh, yes, sir. They rejected the doctrine that the church tried to push on her, that a better self-image would help their leprosy. They knew, let me tell you, they knew it was a far deeper thing than that, that it was more than learning how to think positive about themselves and going to certain classes and learn how to smile when you don't have a smile, learn how to act when you don't know what you're acting. It's more to it than that. They knew it. We're bound. We're chained. We're locked in. We don't buy that. They're rejected from the system. Listen, they, they knew better. They rejected it. Foolish. The Bible said confound the wise. They had gone through the inner healing. Everything called a devil. And they're still not healed. They rejected the notion that his problem stemmed from his father belonging to the Masons. They rejected the, the, the reason that mama belonged to the occult. That's my problem. No, sir. My problem is inherent. And it, it requires a radical surgery. They rejected those games. Vietnam, where this man come from, we'd preach for years and saw many saved. Nobody filled. Three years, four years. Nobody filled with the Holy Spirit. Nobody knew him anything about it. We preached, be filled. Never preached no tongues. Preached the Holy Ghost. Took a man over. He preached the second night over there. And he preached on tongues. Halfway through, I set him down. What's wrong? I said, he don't need tongues. He needs the Holy Ghost. Get the Holy Ghost. He'll get the tongues. That's part and parcel. Amen. He don't, he don't need this. He needs God. That's what he needs. You can play that game. You can play that little game of inner healing when there's anything wrong with you. But when you're looking at a foot that's already eat off, you need more than a good self-image. You need some power. You need something. You need Christ. You need a church that's willing to say in spite of all of this hung bug about psychiatry and everything else, you need nothing but the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the answer to life in every aspect of life. You just need Him. That's all. They need somebody to tell them. Somebody to tell them. Oh, listen. They knew the disease was inherent. Demanded a radical surgery. You can't talk it away. You can't ignore it and it go away. There has to be a believe in God. Now, I said there has to be a believe in God. It's no little matter, ladies and gentlemen. That man, you can talk all you want to talk. And you can talk about getting the devil out of him and the devil being the cause of it. You can talk all you want to talk. But there's got to be reality. Amen. I said there's got to be reality. Why sit we here until we die? You notice that until we die. There's no question about dying, is it? They know if they sit there, if they're going to die. That's more than most folks know. I said, that's more than most people know. They said, why sit here? We may die here. No, until we die. Just a question of when. They knew if they stayed where they are, they're going to die. I talk to people with this television and otherwise. You sit smug in a religious system. You never met Christ personally. You never been birthed of God. Your life has the same desire it always had. You're the same whim. You just added the church and Jesus to what you are. You lost, Mister. Getting drunk isn't death. Going to a ballroom isn't death. That theater isn't death. It's the mind that wants that. That's death. To be carnally minded is death. If you sit here this morning and that's a desire of your heart, you're dead. I said, you're dead. If that's your desire, to be alive is to desire God. Hallelujah. I said, it's to desire God. Listen, until we die, the results is already in. The verdict's in. No matter. We've stepped out of the gate. We've talked in tongues. We've sat down. We're no longer there. And we've got self-righteous. Listen to me. 
Oh, let me tell you, you can die outside as easy you can inside. Just a matter of stepping outside isn't the answer. It's life that's the answer. It's a going on that's the answer. It's being with God that's the answer. I know people talking tongues 25 years ago haven't done anything since. They're right where they were when they started. They are outside. They can look back and talk. Amen. But there's nothing to it. Amen. It's just death. They can't make it to church once a month hardly. Yet they talk about being alive. They have no real desire for spiritual matters. Their whole life is caught up in a system that, that the Bible would tell you in a moment that's what they are. But yet they believe that everything is well. They believe that everything is well. They've stepped out. They've had a little experience. But they stayed right where they were. He said, if you sit here, you're going to die. There isn't any other way. There's no other answer. If you sit here, you will die die. Been here for years. About as dead as the people on the inside. I've lived long enough to see Pentecost become as dead as everybody else. It's a form we talk about. I didn't answer to anything. I said, that didn't answer to anything. The only answer is life. The only thing that God or man's interested in is eternal life. That's all. And just, just being religious. Oh, yes, sir. You've been filled the whole year, 25 years ago, 10 years ago, 2 years ago. I don't mean nothing. You can be as dead on the outside as you're on the inside. Listen, the Holy Ghost come to take us somewhere. Woo! Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, my. Did you hear what I said? He said, why well, sit here? He didn't come set me down the gate of nothing. He come to take me somewhere. The first thing he did was heal a man who couldn't walk right at the gate. What he's saying is, I come to put the church on its feet. Get it walking. Get it moving. Get it stirring. He come to take us somewhere, ladies and gentlemen. They said, why are we sitting here? We was filled with the Holy Ghost ten years ago. Stepped outside of that system. Formed another system. Just dead as the last one. He didn't come for us to form another system. He come for us to make God alive. Did you hear me? I said, He's come through us to make God alive that men can see Christ. That's the whole reason. He didn't come to sit down to anybody's gate. He come to carry us somewhere. Hallelujah. That's somewhere. That's somewhere. Is out the Hebrew said, let us go on. Hallelujah. Don't lay again the foundation of repentance of dead works. This we'll do. Baptism, this we'll do if God permit. But let us go on. Don't sit down here at the gate. Most of Pentecost still sitting at the gate. You hear me? I said they just got in, sat down. Every now and then somebody comes by, stirs them up. They get refilled, set that backslide again. But it's time to walk away from the gate. Time to move on. We either move or die. You hear me? You grow or perish. There's no alternative to this. We either grow or perish. There's one alternative. For them, they said we can sit here and die. That's certain. Or we can go back among the dead. Now we can sit here and die. Or we can go back among the dead. Listen to it. There's a margin of safety inside. The system has reached a point that it can perpetuate itself. Brother Moore said this the other night, that most of them have grown to the place that no matter if they never get anybody saved, enough kids being born to the parents that's going to keep the system going, though the kids never do know God. They just grow up in a system called themselves Baptist, Assembly of God, Pentecostal Holiness, Church of God, something else. But you ever knew, never knew anything about God? You can be all of them and nothing. I said you can be all of them. But there's a margin of safety inside the gate. If we go back in there, at least we don't have to die alone. There's an alternative, they said. We can go back. But said there's famine, death in there too. If we go back there, we're just going to die with them. That's all. Now listen. Listen, out here, out here they're saying, we're beyond the safety of the religious boat. And nothing here. If I, don't, if I don't see God, I'm out. There ain't anything to hang on to out here but God. They're saying we're beyond the safety of that system. We've stepped outside. We've declared ourselves no longer a part of this. We, we by what we become, 
You know, all you got to do, folks, is just know God and walk with God. The system will vomit you out. Now, you can talk in tongues and be what you always were. It won't make any difference. But you get filled with God and you walk in the Holy Spirit. And I can tell you, you're like an illegitimate child at a family reunion. That system will vomit you out like that wheel did Jonah. It can't, it can't assimilate you. If you really know God, it can't assimilate you. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. Religious systems that can't assimilate you vomit you out pretty quick or else you just become apart. If you if you are like Jonah, those digestive juices couldn't do him. They said, history says, he is pale as a ghost when he got out, but he is still all together. Amen. Those acids couldn't eat him up. We may be a little pale, but we're outside. My God, we've got the answer to this world. Hallelujah. It's not in a dead religious system. And if they can't assimilate us, they'll vomit us out. Listen, he said, out here, we're beyond the safety of religious. Seems awful lonely. Ain't nobody out here but us. You know, it just, just seems awful lonesome. You know, now we can go back there. We don't have to live like this. We can go back. We can go back. A decision must be made. The choice is our skin or our soul. See, we've got to make a choice now. They said, here we are. We can sit here and die, or we can go back there and die. We've got to make a choice. It's either our skin or our soul. Now, one of them is going to be lost. It is said to Mr. Dorch in that James Baker ordeal that when they come to him with a little plea bargain, that he spilled everything he knew about Mr. Baker, just told everything about Mr. Baker. And the attorney said, usually when a man has to make a choice between his own hide and his soul, he'll choose his hide. Amen. I can tell you, every man has to come there. Every woman has to come there. They're sitting at that gate. Amen. We're out here. We're by ourselves. You hear me? We're out here by ourselves. Now, we can go back in there and save our hide. We'll die with the crowd, but we can go join. Just be another among the crowd. Nobody know what we look like or nothing else. The devil won't make any difference between us and everybody else. we got to make a choice. We can save our hide or we can save our soul. The apostle Peter, when Christ come a-walking on that water, amen, out there at the fourth watch of the night, they've rode all night, got nowhere. And in the midst of that storm, here he come. They thought he was an aberration of ghosts. Amen. They're frightened. He said, be not afraid. It's I. And the apostle Peter tucked in behind that boat. He says, Lord, if thou that be you bid me to walk on that water. Let me tell you, he's got to leave the safety of that boat now. You hear me? He can't stay there and have an answer. If he is going to know it, he's got to step out on that water. You can step in that boat and die, boy, or you can come out. He stepped out. This book said he walked on the water. But he, oh, hallelujah. He walked. Nobody ever walked on water that didn't get out of that boat. Nobody ever saw God that stayed at that gate. Nobody ever found an answer going back to the death they come out of. But listen, you got out there. That's a frightening place. I've been there a time or two. Not just on real water. But I've been there, man. When it was sure was soft feeling under my feet. I don't know whether this thing going to hold me up or not. And the Bible said he began to sink. Now he had a, he had a decision to make now. He can jump around and grab a hold of the edge of that boat and say, John, for God's sake, get me back in there. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah. I said he can grab the edge of that boat. My godson pulled me back inside. I don't know. I must have been some kind of idiot out here. Ain't nobody ever been out here before. What seems to be wrong? Do you think I'm demented? Did I suddenly go crazy, boys? He could have turned around, grabbed the hold of that boat, and hugged it till it broke the sides. Or else he can go the other direction. To go back to the boat's one thing, but to look on out there. Jesus! Save me! <laughs> oh, my God! Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah! Oh, yes! <laughs> my, my! Never gonna get through today. Hallelujah! Jesus, save me! 
There's a decision to make. You gotta make one. That devil's a liar, Bonnie. God heals lupus. He's a liar. <laughs> Oh, Lord, I feel good about this this morning. Oh, yes. We can go back and be spared of the agony of dying alone. Yeah, we can go back, get in there with the crowd, lose your identity. Just sit down on the back seat somewhere. Just caught in the crowd. Amen. All colors agree in the dark. You come here at midnight tonight and all these lights off. You won't know the red from the black. Amen. All colors agree in the dark. When the light turns on, you begin to see the real. I said the light comes on, you begin to see the real. You have to make your decision. You can go back. You don't have to die alone. Yes, sir. You can go on back there into that crowd. Amen. And it, it seems so lonely. Amen. So lonely. Oh, God. We Listen. Listen. You can go back. You don't have to die alone. All you got to do is tell that system we're wrong in going out in the first place. That's right. All you got to do is come back on your knees and say to them, we're wrong in going out in the first place. I don't know why I believe that Pentecostal stuff. Amen. I don't know why. Just let me back. They'll welcome you back, ladies and gentlemen, if you'll leave Jesus outside. Amen. You can come in talking about him. I'm going to tell you, if you come in there alive, I talked to a young man belonged to a church here in East Texas, right up here uh, at this little town up from us a ways, and he was telling me, he said, I was a youth leader in a church shooting drugs in my arm. I was a whoremonger, but I got mixed up with some Pentecostal folks. I got saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, went back to those youth, and they threw me out. They didn't mind the drugs. They didn't want Christ. Don't bring that Holy Ghost in here. Little, little heroin won't hurt anybody. Little, little crack. Little cocaine, marijuana. Don't bring that Holy Ghost in here. Oh, he said, Pastor, they threw me out. He said, I mean, I thought everybody was going to be so happy. I ain't got no more tracks on my arm. They said, you, you become a fool, man. You lost your mind. We just tell them we're wrong going out in the first place. They'll welcome us. Elders of Israel went to Samson. They said, come on inside the camp. Apologize to the Philistine boy. What do, you, what do you mean out here like this? You know, they said, look, we made a deal with them Philistines. Now, Samson, you hiding out up in these Lehi mountains and jumping on them poor Philistines, spoiling their goods and giving it to the poor. We want that stuff stopped now, you hear me? We want all that mess stopped. We don't want to know this. Let me tell you something, son. We made a deal. We agreed to them Philistines that we'd get rid of some of them radical doctrines. We wouldn't be so adamant about this Holy Ghost. But this man wants it, he can have it. And it isn't something you have to have. And the blood, you know, we don't have to just shout about Believe it in your heart. Cross your fingers when you tell them little lies. But said, so we made a deal with them that we'd drop some of those more radical doctrines and we'd look on them as brothers and said, we worked out a deal, everything's fine. Now, Samson, we want you to apologize. We want you to tell him, folks, you're wrong. He said, let me tell you something, boys. The reason I'm up here acting like I'm acting is this is what the devil did to me. I'm doing to him what he did to me now. And they bound him up. You remember the story? Killed a thousand up with the jawbone of a mule. Amen. A jaw of that living religion killed him. That, that little old jawbone of that little ass. You know, the Bible says the firstborn of every creature is a Lord, but the firstborn of an ass, you break his neck. Amen. Or you redeem him with another one, or break his neck. And somebody just dedicated that little old donkey to God. And with that new consecration, he just slaughtered a thousand of them enemies. But he refused. I said he refused to let that devil have any part of him. Oh, listen. Listen, you just know, listen, by dropping some of those radical beliefs, we can get along all right. There's one possibility, though, they said. We can move against them. Look, man, you ain't all got no feet. What are you talking about? John over here done that leprosy, done got one hand. Joe here, one foot's gone. Me, it's eating on my face. You talking about going against who? And who going against who? Is there somebody out there we're going to enlist? He said, no, I'm talking, boys, about you and me. I'm talking about the lame. Take the prey. <laughs> Woo! 
I'm, I'm talking about the foolish confound in the wise. He said, now look, we can sit here and die, or we can go back and die them folks, but there's something else we could do. What's that, boys? Say, we can't get out of here. I said, we can get out of here. Amen. That, that is the answer. You see, when you begin to move out against that darkness, amen, when we begin to move, when we begin to step out, then that, that's the time that God goes into action. He never moves as long as we play it safe. Amen. The Ananias and Sapphira may give half of it, hoping the thing may be true and they'll gain something by it. They're only going to die with the dead. That's all. It's the people that throw it all. I said throw Throw it all onto it that really find the answer. Amen. Lift your hands and praise God with me here for a moment. You have many symbols, words, that, uh, symbols of the Holy Spirit, and they're tended by God to reveal to you and I the different functions of this great orderly Spirit of God. Amen. Wind and water are both symbols of the Holy Spirit. They're given to us, they are, and they represent two different functions of the Spirit. When you, when you see them, you have fire, you have oil, but here we have wind and water, and they represent different functions of this, of this Holy Ghost. Now, we talked about the rivers of living water. Now, the rivers are plural, but the water is always singular. It's the same water. John said, this spake he of the Spirit. As in, in, in John 7, Jesus on that great day of the feast said, He that believeth on me, as the Scripture have said, out of his innermost being shall flow rivers, plural, of living water, singular. John said, this spake he of the Holy Ghost. That river of water in us is the Holy Ghost in us. That's what he's saying. And so we have, we have, we've talked about that it is in the flowing of this river that everything becomes possible. It is the blessings of God. If that river flows, everything is there. You don't have to beg God for anything out of that. Whatever that river touches, it'll make alive. Whatever that river moves on, it will heal. You don't have to beg it to flow. Just blow up the dam. Get rid of whatever's hindering the channel, blocking the channel, and the river will flow. So the water is the river. It is the uh, Spirit moving to do the will of God. But the wind, the blowing of the wind, is always the preparation for the flowing of that river. Now you keep that in your mind. The blowing of the wind is a preparation of, for the flowing of that river now. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord. Psalms 24, verses 4 and 5. The conditions always have to be met. If that river is to flow, then the conditions have to be right. And the blowing of that wind always exposes that which is not of God. The wind, many times we'll not allow him to come in that purging way. We're afraid of him in that direction. But all we do is shut up the channel when we refuse, when we refuse to let the wind blow. The staff here at Acts America TV is honored to dedicate this webcast to the ministry of Pastor B.H. Clendenin. Through this man's obedience to the will of God, the message of Pentecost is truly being restored all across the world. Brother Clendenin has been an ordained minister of the Assembly of God now for over 50 years. At the age of 70, God called Pastor Clendenin to resign his church in Beaumont, Texas and move to Russia to start the first school of Christ. Hudson Taylor, the great missionary to inland China, had prophesied in a European convention in 1874 that out of Russia, a movement of God would rapidly spread across the world just before the coming of Christ, raising up disciples in every nation. The history of the School of Christ has accomplished just that. We believe that the School of Christ International is the direct fulfillment of that prophecy of Hudson Taylor. In the past 16 years since 1992, 
the, Rush, the school of Christ has spread into over 150 nations of the world. One of the greatest missionary tools we have ever seen in the history of the church. All across the world, men and women are being raised up to be voices in these last days. When we look at Brother Clendenin, we can truly see the life of another being manifested in this vessel. He's truly a modern day Paul. His sacrifice and uncompromising faith is a living testimony to the very faithfulness of God in a yielded vessel. He has been a tremendous testimony to every preacher, every man, woman, boy and girl on the face of this earth that has known his ministry to God's true faithfulness when a vessel truly yields to the will of God for their lives. Obviously, he was brought into the kingdom of God for such a time as this. We gladly, with honor, dedicate Acts America TV to this man of God. Pastor B.H. Clendenin. God bless you, sir, and thank you for your faithfulness. Darkness shining, Jesus' light. 